One of the weirdest things about me is that I'm a very online person who hates online culture. I spend a lot of my day on Twitter grousing at all the memes that the kids come up with. If I wasn't a moron, I'd just log off. But I think part of me just loves being miserable. And the internet is the right place for misery. It feels like being online just makes everything more toxic. That's especially true with politics. The odd thing about online politics is that it can be incredibly insular. You would think that, given that the internet is essentially borderless, people wouldn't be able to wall themselves off in these little hermetically sealed communities. But you'd be wrong. That sort of thing happens all the time. And sometimes these communities even form around a particular person. Tulsi Gabbard is one of these people. Gabbard comes from an important family in Hawaii politics. Her dad has been in the state senate since 2006. She made a name for herself on the online left in 2016 when she resigned as vice chair of the DNC in protest of how they were treating Bernie Sanders, who she went on to endorse. On top of this, she's a critic of America's foreign policy, particularly our military engagements, which naturally makes her popular with the anti-war crowd, which includes much of the online left. Though some people in that community are skeptical of her commitment to these principles. The fact that she serves in the Army Reserve lent her credibility on this front. She's not anti-American or anti-troop. She just doesn't like these supposedly pointless wars. Oh, and she's hot. Just ask the dude that runs the New Hampshire Libertarian Party Twitter account. At one point in time, she had real-life power. She served four consecutive terms in Congress, and, as I said earlier, she was vice chair of the DNC until she stepped down. These qualities also helped her attain fake political power in the form of internet popularity. After 2016, there was a small but very vocal online subculture calling for her to run for president. And whether she did it as a publicity stunt, as people often do, or if she genuinely thought she could win, on January 11th, 2019, she announced that she was seeking the Democratic nomination for the presidency. How did this go for her? Well, she got two delegates. For reference, you need 1,991 delegates to get the nomination. Both of her delegates were from American Samoa, the place where she was born. That probably helped her there, though she lost the territory on the whole to Mike Bloomberg, who dropped a billion dollars on his campaign and came away with this as his only victory. I'll let you decide who's more pathetic between the two. This just goes to show that being popular online doesn't translate to substantial, real-life political support. You can appear on Joe Rogan's podcast, have an army of idiots who will white knight for you 24-7 on Twitter, and have YouTube personalities like Jimmy Dore and Nico House shilling for you constantly, but that doesn't mean that people will go through the trouble of actually showing up to vote for you on election day. Andrew Yang was also very popular online, but he did even worse than Gabbard did. Compare this to Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders, who were both super popular online, but also had real-life support on top of that. Meanwhile, Joe Biden had almost no online support, and he won the Democratic nomination running away, and won the general election after that. Being popular online is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for gaining real-life political power. The moment you realize that most people who vote aren't active on Twitter is the moment you understand this distinction. You either get that, or you don't. There are people who think that there's no way John Fetterman could have beaten Dr. Oz, because wouldn't you know, Dr. Oz has way more followers on Instagram. Therefore, the election must have been rigged. These people have no idea that they're looking at it completely backwards, and probably never will. A couple of years after her failed presidential candidacy, to the surprise of no one, Tulsi Gabbard left the Democratic Party, saying that it was controlled by an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness, who are dragging us ever closer to a nuclear war. She then signed on to be a contributor with Fox News, and even filled in for Tucker Carlson when he was out. During the 2022 midterms, Gabbard endorsed a number of different Republican candidates, including Blake Masters, Don Bulldock, Carrie Lake, and Tudor Nixon, all of whom went on to lose. In fact, out of her 13 endorsements, only three of them won their races. While she may still be popular online, her track record in the real world has some establishment conservatives concerned. As Bobby Miller writes at National Review, between her past ideas, the likely opportunism of her recent shifts, and her lousy endorsement record in these midterms, Tulsi Gabbard offers little of interest to conservatives. Maybe she'll be able to persuade more conservatives over time, but I'm skeptical. Now, why is it that despite ample opportunities, she hasn't gotten back real-life political support in a significant way? Well, I think the main reason is that she picked the wrong issue. Her isolationism may get people like Michael Tracy excited, but there's little evidence to suggest that most voters actually care about it in real life. Before I get into the details, it's worth noting that there are legitimate questions about her credibility on this issue. She has said that, while she doesn't support our forever wars, she is a hawk on the question of Islamic terrorism. 
Given that Islamic terrorism was the focus of much of the foreign policy of the Bush, Obama, and Trump presidencies, I wonder how much her hawkishness on this issue would actually change foreign policy in a significant way. Given how much Tulsi flips on other issues, it wouldn't be too surprising if she flipped on this one. That is, if she's ever in a position of power again, which hopefully won't happen. Isolationists tend to think that the United States' foreign policy is the same regardless of who is president or which party controls Congress. I don't think that holds up under scrutiny, but I get why they feel that way. Their views, for better or worse, are so divergent from the status quo that, from their perspective, the distinctions between the Bush and Obama foreign policies, for example, are so insignificant as to be immaterial. Their interests are very rarely represented amongst the candidates that have a legitimate opportunity to actually get elected. Perhaps this is why they gravitate so strongly to someone who says the things they like on the rare instances when one such person comes along. Unfortunately for them, being concerned about foreign policy, and in particular, being an isolationist, much like Tulsi Gabbard herself, is a much bigger deal online than it is in real life. For better or worse, most Americans don't pay attention to foreign affairs, and the vast majority don't vote on them. Think about it in the most recent election. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is by far the biggest news story of this year. Granted, there are still a few weeks left in this year, but I doubt that will change. How many candidates did you hear during the midterms talk about Ukraine? I heard very little, and I pay pretty close attention to this stuff. Most of what I heard was about abortion, or protecting democracy, or transgender people, or inflation. But very little on foreign policy, much less Ukraine. The most I heard was that Kevin McCarthy said maybe we'll stop sending so much aid to Ukraine when the Republicans take the House. According to polling, there was very little attention to this paid by the electorate. As a survey conducted by Northeastern University said, when asked to select from a dozen urgent issues, self-identified Republicans and independents both placed inflation and the economy economy above all others, as their first and second most important issues. The survey of more than 21,000 Americans found, when self-identified Democrats were asked to choose from the same list, which included a number of hot topics such as American democracy, women's rights, police brutality, and the COVID-19 pandemic, they selected climate change and racism as their top two issues, with inflation not far behind. In third place, the survey found. Those of you who watch this channel know that I think issues matter very little in politics. Even if you assume that they do, and you assume that polling and surveys serve as a reliable predictor of voter behavior, then there's very little evidence to suggest that foreign policy motivates voters in a significant way. Historically speaking, there's very little evidence either, at least according to political science literature. As the Washington Post reported back in 2016, from decades of research, we know voters do not pay much attention to foreign policy. Some research shows that the public has stable, coherent attitudes on foreign policy, but few dispute that most voters have very little concrete foreign policy information. Rather than follow debates closely, voters generally look to elites and the media for information, even for specific foreign policy issues. What about national security? Public opinion research has shown that even in wartime, the public used elite cues as shortcuts for understanding conflicts ranging from Iraq and Vietnam to World War II. If elite opinion about a conflict is divided along partisan lines, then the partisan split will likely show up in public opinion. So voters generally leave foreign policy to elites. This strategy makes sense for busy people focused on matters close to home. The one time in my life that foreign affairs and national security seemed to matter was after 9-11 and the Iraq War. Obviously, there was a lot of concern after the terrorist attacks, much of which the media fed into. Furthermore, in my experience, public opinion tracked very closely with the press on the Iraq War. When the press was mostly for it, public opinion went along with it, helping put popular support behind the invasion initially. When the war went south, the media turned against it, and so did the public. It's hard to say in real time who was leading whom, but if the elite theory of public opinion espoused by the Washington Post is accurate, then most of the public was likely following media cues. Barack Obama's response to the Bush administration demonstrates pretty well how the political incentives are aligned on the issues of foreign policy and national security, both of which were closely related when it came to Islamic terrorism. Obama campaigned against the Iraq War and Bush's national security and intelligence apparatus that was assembled after 9-11. In 2007, Senator Barack Obama said that the Bush administration puts forward a false choice between the liberties we cherish and the security we demand. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our constitution and our freedom. 
Most of Obama's first year was pretty ambiguous on the national security front. That is, until the first big scare of his presidency. The big event that changed Obama's outlook was on Christmas Day 2009, when Farouk Abdul-Matala attempted to destroy a Northwest Airlines plane with makeshift plastic explosives concealed in his underwear. After this near miss, Obama and his team were concerned that having another major terrorist attack on American soil, or even being perceived as being soft on terrorism, would damage the president politically and possibly jeopardize a second term. So Obama and his legal team started to do something incredibly cynical. They ever so slightly altered their criticisms of the Bush security apparatus, while also reconciling much of it legally. As Charlie Savage, a New York Times reporter who has followed this issue closely, wrote in his book, Power Wars, The Relentless Rise of Presidential Authority and Secrecy. To be sure, some of Obama's rhetorical blasts at Bush touched on the civil liberties concerns. This administration acts like violating civil liberties is the way to enhance our security. It is not. But when Obama detailed what he meant beyond his absolute rejection of torture, his specific complaints and promises were heavily tilted toward fixing the legal process. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens, he said. No more national security letters to spy on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. No more tracking citizens who do nothing more than protest a misguided war. No more ignoring the law when it is inconvenient. That is not who we are, and it is not what is necessary to defeat the terrorists. The FISA court works. The separation of powers works. Our Constitution works. The parsing was careful, too. It sounded like a wholesale rejection of Bush policy outcomes, but it was really just about making sure the legal foundation was solid. Lawful surveillance programs, meaning those authorized by Congress and subject to the FISA court's oversight, were fine. All this culminates in the second helpful model for determining whether Obama acted like Bush. If one takeaway is that the Bush-Cheney legal team was consciously seeking to expand presidential power as an ideological end in itself, a key point to understand about the Obama legal team is that they were trying to fight al-Qaeda while adhering to what they saw as the rule of law. President Obama and most of his people appeared in practice to care somewhat more about civil liberties than President Bush and most of his team. But the Obama team was not, and never had been, the full-throated civil libertarians that Senator Obama had allowed and encouraged his supporters in the Democratic primary campaign to think, and his opponents to fear, they would be. The crucial insight that arises from this model is that by the time Obama inherited the presidency, many controversial post-9-11 policies had a much stronger legal basis than when Bush first created them. In 2013, it was revealed that the National Security Agency was systemically collecting bulk metadata on Americans' phone calls. Obama responded to this revelation by saying, I think that the American people understand that there are some trade-offs involved. I think that it's important to recognize that you can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy and zero inconvenience. You know, we're going to have to make some choices as a society. It's funny because Senator Obama, back in 2007, insisted that the Bush administration had presented America with a false choice between civil liberties and our safety. What happened in the seven years between those two quotations? Probably a lot of things. But the most important, in my estimation, was that certain political realities reasserted themselves. Obama realized that he had way more to lose politically from a successful major terrorist attack happening on American soil than he did from being caught spying on Americans. So he started doing the latter to help prevent the former to hedge his bets. A second 9-11 really could have cost Obama a second term. What has the NSA bulk data collection cost Obama? Nothing that I can think of. He's still well-revered in the country and is the most important person in the Democratic Party. The only real backlash he got was from civil liberty hawks, who, for better or worse, are largely irrelevant in American political discourse. Most Americans simply don't care that much about the surveillance state. They do, however, care way more about their safety. Do you think that Tulsa Gabbard would decide differently were she in Obama's position? Given her flip-flopping on other things, I doubt it. But more importantly, the political incentives would push her strongly in the same direction. We'll probably never find out, as, as long as this is her signature issue, she likely won't gain ground with most of the public. Will foreign policy or national security forever be minor issues in American politics? I wouldn't say that. Another major event like 9-11 could change public opinion in a significant way. 
a war where we have to institute a draft, which would mean that a significant amount of the voting public was actually invested in it, could get the public to be more concerned about foreign policy and demand that the government finally rein things in. Until something like that happens, there's very little political capital to be gained by politicians by favoring rolling back America's foreign policy commitments, or reining in the national security state. Will Tulsi Gabbard forever be an online personality with long-shot political aspirations? I won't rule anything out in American politics, including Gabbard actually becoming important once again. Maybe she will become Donald Trump's VP candidate, as some people have speculated she's trying to do. If that's what she's angling for, she's in the right spot as a Fox News contributor. But I have a sneaking suspicion she won't be going anywhere anytime soon. Mm.